Nakas from Leicester to tell us all about it. Thank you for asking me to present that. I mean, uh, Paul knows that I'm anti-EPP all my life. I was, I was born like that. Uh, because um, I went to work in uh, Leicester as a registrar when uh, there was an awful lot of EPPs being done and I've seen all the complications happening. Um, high volume, before I forget, I've done two last week, I've done one yesterday, I'm doing one tomorrow of these. I consider myself to be high volume. I can't go on and do eight a year though because my back is going to give way. Okay. So in, in, in the reality, in the UK reality, Leicester would do probably 50, 60 radicals a year between two surgeons. And we are a high volume center. And the, the largest radical historically operations was, you know, in that range, 25 a year probably. Um, so um, the title that uh, collective medical is the new standard of care has been chosen by the organizers of the university. Uh, Briefly, this is the latest statistic from the health safety executive. So initially they thought that the disease in the UK would peak in 2012. We know now this is not happening. This is expected to peak at 2019 at some point. We have the second largest incidence in the world after Australia, and we register the same amount of cases as America. And if you think that we're now resecting 20, 25% of the referrals, we should be doing 500 radical operations for mesothelioma in the UK every year. And obviously we're not. So we just need to find out why. Most of the people now present with the largest uh, interval period because we see people that were exposed because of the building trade that were exposed to brown asbestos. So these people usually takes more than 30 years instead of the 25 years or 20 years that it would take for crusido light and people in the shipbuilding industry. Uh, and the health safety executive thinks that the disease is going to peak at some point around about 2020 but they think that the decline is not going to be exponentially as significant as the rise. So we think we're still going to be seeing mesothelioma at high incidence for quite some time to come. So the treatment options for, the, for mesothelioma uh, can be from active symptom control to an intraenipronal catheter. For many people, this was the standard of care for many, many years. A tactical disease is a treatment for me. Chemotherapy is treatment, surgery, radiotherapy, and then you go to new stuff like PDT, which is applied in, in large scale by one center in the world that I know of. Intracavitar chemotherapy has been tried. Immunotherapy, we have at least two trials in the UK currently employing immunotherapy for the treatment of mesothelioma. Uh, one of them in combination with chemotherapy is COVOS. The other one, plain immunotherapy. Uh, the mainstay of radical surgery is this, and it's not surprising that David Sugarbaker came up with this concept that you can never get R0 resection when you do radical surgery for mesothelioma. The best you can hope for is R1, the microscopic disease that you're going to leave. You need to have a systemic treatment that's going to take care of it, and this is going to be chemotherapy, or in the case of the EPP, the high dose whole hemithorax radiotherapy. And non-radical non surgery has a part to play because it can be used to palliate, it can be used to diagnose, it can be used to control diffusion. And there was a question, and this question has been, remained unanswered for many years, but recently, if it's going to have any benefit to pain control or any uh, benefit to survival. So historically, and all the years I've been doing presentations for MISO, I say that we could offer five operations for mesothelioma, starting from the smallest, which is VATS and TALC, which is something that pretty much everybody can do. Vasculectomy decortication. This is the R2, but R2, I take out 500 grams of tumor and I live in two kilos of tumor, R2. That's what I'm referring to. Extended pleurectomy decortication, and I agree with the definition by the ISLC. I personally try not to leave not even one centimeter of tumor. If I leave that, I consider it to be R2. I aim to eliminate all disease that I can see in the chest, and then obviously the EPP. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Pretty much everybody can have it. One point for people who don't do radical surgery, talc makes the life of the surgeon who performs radical surgery very much easier. So by all means, if uh, you have any questions, do talc the patient always. If it's non-talc, like the one from uh, yesterday, I think, it was, not, it was not very easy to, to take out because uh, the visceral decortication becomes uh, very, very painful after that. And actually, you induce more damage to the lung if the patient is not talked when you do the visceral decortication. The advantage is that pretty much everybody can have talc. 
the disadvantage is that median survival is going to be pretty much the same, similar to the natural progress of disease. Um, the Lucada data incorporates all patients, including the patients that had radical surgery. Where it says surgery, it includes the patients with TAG. So I, I, your comment is true about the tail end of the survival curve, but uh, it's very, very generic, and we don't have a breakdown of how many patients of these had actually any sort of surgery or just TAG or just chemotherapy. Uh, if lung is trapped, well, this is going to fail, so you might need to convert to a vast plurectomy decortication, which for many years was something that has been advocated as, as the best thing since sliced bread because it would be VATS, so minimally invasive. It would decorticate the lung. It would expand the lung. Uh, it would get uh, symptom control. It would get effusion control. Um, but sometimes it would be impossible to do it. We know from mesovats that it will not prolong survival. We also know from mesovats that it will not really do much for controlling symptoms. Uh, it's got significant mortality. Mesovats support the mortality between 2 and 3 percent. I mean, in our, my experience, in our retrospective series, in older than 65 years old patients, the mortality was similar to the mortality of the radical operations, was in the range of 6 percent. It's going to have prolonged air leak. It's not very suitable for bulky disease, and if the lung does not expand with that, you might have to convert to an open, which is the two kilograms of tumor being left in, which, to my experience, is not a very good operation because when I looked retrospectively again at our results, I could not find any survival advantage to that. You sub the patient is going to have a big operation. The patient is going to have a thoracotomy. You're going to try to take out as much lung, as much sorry, tumor as possible, but you're still going to leave large amounts of tumor in the diaphragm because you do not remove it. And in most of the cases, the vast majority of the cases, these are the cases I see, the bulk of the disease is in the uh, diaphragm and the pericardium. And uh, if you accept that you need to get microscopic clearance, then you should really be doing that. So I keep this picture because this is the only one that we've ever done through media stenotomy. I think that was after the year that we we're doing media stenotomies for EPPs. And uh, this is the specimen. So you do a full parietoporectomy, you go into the, the fissures. The, the comments about bulky disease in the fissures, a disease involving the pulmonary artery, yes, it can be very, very difficult. Uh, it can be very, very painful. Uh, I think that in most of the cases, you can still do it. It's going to take you longer uh, rather than doing an EPP, and you're going to damage the lung more. The EPP spares the lung. This is the main advantage. Because in the monectomy, uh, many people say it's a disease in itself. This comment upsets David Sugarbaker every time he hears it, but I, I will still stick by it. I think that the monectomy is a disease by itself. So avoiding it makes an awful lot of difference. It's more suitable for elderly patients. I know that because now we operate on 80-year-olds with the same mortality. Whilst the mortality that we had for EPPs in older than 65, in 13 patients that we've done it, was one in five patients was dead, it was 20%. So the mortality for EPP at the elderly group of patients becomes prohibitively high. Uh, it's got significantly less morbidity, complications, and impact on the quality of life than the EPP. The problem is that because you leave the lung, you have a new problem of the air leak and pleural sepsis, and this is the usual killer when you do an EPD. The mortality is still significant. The patient needs to be fit for surgery. They do not need to have respiratory function, which is going to allow them to, to have a neurotoxin, but they need to be fit. The presence of lung does not allow for a whole hemothorax radiotherapy, so you're not going to be able to control microscopic disease with that. But whole hemothorax radiotherapy is a blessing and a curse at the same time because you can have complications from that. And if disease involves the lung parenchyma extensively, then you have no option but to remove it by doing an EPP. The EPP advantage is this and not complicated by a leak. And the disadvantages, I think that Paul has described them very well, so I don't need to elaborate much. And my argument is that of the five operations that I mentioned, we should really be doing two, either a vascular biopsy or prolodesis, or if we have to do a radical operation, go for an extended prolectomy decortication. So the mass feasibility trial, uh, I will quickly run through it because uh, Paul has already uh, referred to it, and indeed, only eight patients received radical radiotherapy. So only eight patients completed trimodality treatment. The thing that was not reported, and not anecdotally, because I treated these two patients, was that two patients developed late bronchopleural fistulas because of the radiotherapy. 
One of them is six months, the other one in eight months after the operation. So this was a, a confounding factor of another treatment within the feasibility trial that added to the mortality of the EPP, which was not really taken into account when they reported. And I, I will not defend EPP, but this was indeed a very, very small number of patients to be able to say that EPP is not a good operation for that. So when the public, when they published the result, everybody around the world that was doing radical surgery for mesothelioma was not very happy. So I was a correspondent at the time. And I think that they had the point. The argument also was that because it took them, uh, the mass uh, feasibility took uh, more than two years to recruit the 16 patients, even the feasibility would, might, someone might argue that it's not, uh, it's not on. The Misovats uh, ran for nearly 10 years and was aimed to assess whether VATS decortication would do uh, anything to prolong survival or alleviate symptoms. Uh, it started in one center, it opened to more centers. The target recruitment was 196 uh, patients. Uh, there was a very detailed study where they measured the cost of the health service, uh, but the, eventually uh, the, uh, so there was no survival benefits and uh, there was a tendency to show some symptom uh, improvement benefit, but it was not statistically significant. So as it is, I don't think that the mesovats also proved anything about the VATS decortication. The ERTC phase two trial that uh, Paul mentioned is going to perform radical surgery anyway, but it's going to evaluate the role of chemotherapy before or after. And the argument for chemotherapy uh, after is that uh, you're not going to have disease progression. The argument for chemotherapy before is that you're going to have everybody having chemotherapy anyway. My local oncologist, uh, Professor Fennell, argues that giving chemotherapy up front might trigger stem cells and might induce resistance to chemotherapy. We'll see about that. The MAS-2 aims to evaluate the role of EPD in uh, chemotherapy and chemotherapy combined versus chemotherapy alone. So the feasibility aims to recruit 50 patients in two years, around the minus 25 in surgery, the full study, another 285, total of 235 within five years. It's a portfolio of trials because it's going to be a quality of life trial, uh, and the patients are going to be assessed, consented. They're going to have two cycles of chemotherapy, CT week five, MDT week six. If patients, uh, six, if patients randomized to non-surgical arm, four more cycles of chemotherapy starting week seven, eight. At least that's the last time that, <laughs> that, we, met, that, we, that we said. The patient will need to see a surgeon Okay, uh, up front, uh, if the patient wants to be randomized, because the surgeon will need to explain how the patient might die as a result of the surgical procedure. And then after that, EPD or no EPD, and the patient is going to have four cycles of chemo. Uh, two centers to do the feasibility, which is 25 procedures. Reference centers watch each other operate, because we need to make sure that we're going to have uh, the same uh, operation being done, and we're going to have quality assurance about this. Uh, it will open in less than Sheffield, and then one for every region in phase two. Uh, there was a problem with the clinical trials evaluation unit of the Imperial. We had the site visit in Leicester. Well, we are ready to start, but we don't have any, anything like patient information sheets or anything. We should be able to start as soon as. If we start, we can do the feasibility just in less than six months. Uh, but as I said, there are 500 patients every year that could potentially be eligible for randomization in, uh, in MAS-2, uh, and uh, there, is some, there is a degree of nihilism uh, about radical surgery for mesothelioma, which I think needs to be addressed. So what type of surgery? Uh, everybody can have a, a VATS uh, and a TALC, EPD, selected cases, and then, in my humble opinion, uh, I think that we either do uh, radical by APD or we just leave the patients with uh, the talc. The selection criteria are the same as for any sort of uh, radical surgery. We can, I mean, eight is the oldest that, we, that we've done. Uh, true T4 we can't do and infected space is a contraindication because we do use synthetic patches to reconstruct. I don't think that we can afford it. Uh, quickly, how radical is radical? So this is the first example of radical, early disease. Uh, 
which presented with pneumothorax, and this is the post-op scan, so everybody would argue this is the patch of the diaphragm, that this is an easy one to do. Uh, and this is, I uh, think, 18 months down the line. But this is the second case. This was not an easy one to do. Same case, and this was the post-op field. <coughs> so even with bulky disease, you will get it out. You will get clearance. It might take you uh, eight hours. And uh, the survivals, and the evidence for the survivals is that when we looked, uh, that's the latest survivalist about our retrospective data, there's no survival difference between EPD and EPP, and these are the uh, medians, this is confidence intervals, these are the five-year survivals. But the most interesting, this is the Lucada data, so the one-year survival is roughly 40%. The most interesting thing is that when we add chemotherapy to radical surgery, the survival improves dramatically, and this is a significant factor that predicts survival. But actually, not having chemotherapy is a hazard factor of 1.4. Thank you.